Hello friends and welcome to my YouTube channel Way to Success. In my previous video, I have discussed about the introduction of cell signaling pathways, various components which are taking part in the cell signaling pathway and signal transduction like your signal molecules which we also call ligand and your receptors. We have discussed two different type of signal molecules that is your lipophilic and hydrophilic molecules and certain receptors right intracellular receptors are there and extracellular receptors are there intracellular receptors we have already discussed that are found inside the cell in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus and the extracellular cell uh, extracellular receptors which are present at the surface of the cell these extracellular receptors are basically your transmembrane receptors and today we are going to discuss about these uh, cell surface receptor and first cell surface receptor i am going to discuss about is a g protein coupled receptor which we generally called gpcrs right I have already told you these are the cell surface receptor. This is a particular family of receptors which we call G protein coupled receptors. Right? These are the transmembrane receptors with two domains. One domain is present extracellularly and the other is present cytoplasmically. So moving further why we call it a g protein coupled receptor right its name signifies that this receptor bounds or interacts with the g proteins these g proteins are the guanine nucleotide binding proteins why we are calling it a g protein i'm going to discuss it so moving to the g protein because before going further and knowing the pathway and what is the function of this g protein coupled receptor and how it works it is very very important that we should know what a g protein is what is its structure and how it functions right because ultimately the response is being generated because of this if this won't be there the response won't be generated so it is necessary that we should understand what a g protein is and its function so a g protein is a guanine nucleotide binding protein right it has three subunits right we are going to discuss it now so before that we should know that there are two kind of g proteins first one is monomeric g protein and second one is trimeric g protein in this video i'm going to discuss more about this trimeric g protein and when we are going to discuss about the tyrosine kinase pathway then i'm going to discuss about these monomeric g proteins because there you will get to know what a monomeric g protein is and how it functions in that tyrosine kinase pathway these are certain examples of these two kind of g protein ras ro rab ran etc these are the examples of your monomeric g protein and g alpha s g alpha i o g alpha q 11 these are certain examples of trimeric g protein so as i have already told you that g protein are of two types so here i am going to discuss more about the trimeric g protein trimeric g protein is basically a heterotrimer why it is heterotrimer because it has three different subunits alpha beta and gamma the alpha and gamma subunits are covalently linked to the plasma membrane the lipid bilayer right and these two the gamma and beta forms the dimer because this alpha subunit will ultimately detach from this dimer and interact with the effector after getting the signal right why we call it a g protein because its alpha subunit the alpha subunit of your g protein interacts or bound with the g 
GTP or GDP that is your guanine nucleotides right it is generally called the GTPA switch protein because it switches between the GTP and GDP when this is in inactive form that is when we are not getting any signal the cell is not getting any signal right the ligand is not bound to the receptor in that case this g protein is in inactive form what happens in that it is bound to the gdp and as soon as the cell get the signal that is the ligand attached to this uh, receptor it signals the g protein and what happens next the gdp is removed and gtp uh, will be replaced by that gdp uh, sorry that gdp is replaced by that gtp so what happens there is an excess amount of gtp present in our cells whenever the signal comes that gdp will be removed and gtp will attach to this alpha uh, subunit and this g protein will be activated what happens next this alpha subunit will be detached from this dimer and will interact with the effector leading to the formation of second messengers and ultimately lead to the response generation so we have discussed that they have uh, this uh, g protein has two states one is active and one is inactive state when it is active it bound to gtp and when it is in inactive state it bound to gdp it has its intrinsic gtpas activity why it has its gtpas in uh, active uh, gtpas activity because the signal is coming continuously right it has to stop otherwise it will lead to the response generation continuously we don't need a continuous response generation so to stop it we have certain desensitization processes one of it is your intrinsic gtpas activity this alpha subunit has this activity in this activity what happens the gtp will be hydrolyzed and the uh, g protein will be inactive again what happens next it will release from the effector and the second messenger will not be formed anymore so this intrinsic gtpas activity is very very necessary there are certain proteins which accelerate this gtpas activity and these proteins are known as gtpas activating proteins these are the regulators of g protein signaling now coming back to this the structure of your g protein coupled receptors this is a transmembrane receptors and these receptors have seven transmembrane helices that is why it is known as seven transmembrane receptor or serpentine receptor i have already told you it has two domains one is extracellular and intracellular extracellular domain has the amino group attached to it and the cytoplasmic domain has the carboxylic group attached to it whenever this ligand binds to this particular receptor these receptors have loop like structures and these loop like structures act as the ligand binding site right this ultimately lead to the conformational change when the ligand bind to the receptor receptor undergoes a conformational change and will be activated which ultimately gives the signal to this g protein leading to its activation and further process so different kind of these g pcrs are present and they attach to different kind of ligands for example we have certain receptors gpcrs like uh, your beta androgenic receptors serotonin receptors rhodopsin mast cells etc there are certain other gpcrs also but these are the major ones right they can interact with different kind of ligands 
which have the uh, the specificity for that particular receptor like if we talk about beta endogenic receptors they have the stimulus with uh, your epinephrine means ligand which work with your uh, beta endogenic receptor is epinephrine with your serotonin receptor goes the serotonin uh, your ligand with rhodopsin photons work as the ligand so there are various ligands and various g protein coupled receptors are there and similarly for them various effectors work and gives the physiological response so there are certain ligands like various hormones are there neurotransmitters opium derivatives photons chemoattractants are there i have already given you the example of this rhodopsin it is a kind of gpcr and transducin work uh, as a g protein right so these are certain example of ligand and now i'm going to discuss about the process which is taking part in the g protein coupled receptor pathway this is a kind of pathway which will take place for the response generation for example we are taking the receptor as your androgenic receptor beta androgenic and your ligand as epinephrine right so what happens the ligand binds to the receptor and alternate alter its conformation right and increases its affinity for the g protein to which it binds in next step what happens the g alpha subunit releases its gdp which is replaced by the gtp right it has been replaced by the gdp right what happens next this alpha subunit will be dissociated from the g beta gamma right this g alpha will be dissociated from g beta gamma complex and binds to the effector right in this case this effector will be adenylyl cyclase activating the effector right what happens next this activated adenylyl cyclase produces the camp how it produces the camp it will transform this atp into camp that is your cyclic adenosine monophosphate so this is a particular mechanism of receptor mediated activation of the effector so after this process ends when the response is finally generated what happens this al gtp will be released and gdp will bind to this alpha subunit because of your gtpase activity which is present intrinsically in this alpha subunit so this ultimately leads to the removal of this gtp and addition of gdp which ultimately lead to the uh, means this alpha subunit then leaves this effector and get attached to the beta gamma complex again right so leading to the uh, inactivation of your effector and ultimately the cam production will be stopped there are certain other factors which are working to stop this signaling so that the response will be ultimately stop i uh, means it won't continuously be uh, responding so we will discuss those factors which are working in the desensitization of this particular uh, receptor later on along with certain other major factors and the function of this camp in different pathways we are going to discuss later on in my next videos so till then stay tuned if you like my videos please give me a thumbs up and subscribe my channel 
and please if you want to uh, comment anything you can so till then bye bye